Hi, this is Misha, and today we're looking at a couple of rifles that are supposedly based on and developments of the M1 Grand. We thought we'd compare them to each other and, uh, and the Grand. We had the Grand out for a different video. <laughs> this is the original U.S. military M1 Grand. This one was made right after Korea by Harrington and Richardson. It's pretty well all GI, firing 30-06. And we're going to compare it to it's a little out of my way. The Italian Beretta BM59, which we also have a full-fledged video on if you want to check out more history of this particular gun. This is a 1980 Springfield built on an Italian receiver in all Italian parts. So it's a pre-pin with all the military features still intact. And finally, we have another Springfield. This is a Springfield M1A, built in the mid-90s from GI parts, including the barrel. So it's an M14, except for the receiver and lack of the fun switch. Now, after World War II, several shortcomings of the M1 Grand were addressed, mainly the, the lack of the magazine. They were decided that going the detachable mag, World War II had happened, they had seen the benefits of things like the MP44 as well as many, many other guns with detachable mags. Also, the 30 6 cartridge was getting kind of long in the tooth and old by the day standards. So they ended up developing what became the T65 light rifle cartridge, which would evolve into 762 NATO. It was essentially a 30 6 but about 12 millimeters shorter about 10% lighter, so on and so shorter, a little bit lighter, and it was kind of optimized for working in self-loading rifles. Now the US would design the M14 after, this, after Korea. They would look into evolving the Grand in 1954 as soon as Korea was over. They would start with the T20 prototype, which would turn into the T44, which would be adopted as the M14 in 1957. Now this was billed as a Garand, but firing the new 7.62 NATO 308 cartridge and with the detachable box mag. Also, originally it was select fire with the intention that this could replace not only the M1 Garand, M1 Carbine, but also the 1918 BAR and the M3 grease gun and M1 Thompson, some machine guns. So they tried to have a one size fits all gun with this thing. When they were basically this passed the trial, the T44, as did the T48, which was an Americanized FAL. It was produced by Harrington and Richardson as well. In, uh, under contract here in the US. The reason they went with the T-44, well, it was an American design, so sure. They also told the military, hey, we can use a lot of the same tooling and even a lot of the same parts as the M1 Grand here. This was pretty much a phony bill of sale from the beginning. They couldn't. They had to develop new tooling. This receiver is specifically made for 308 76 Tornado, so it's a different receiver. The gas system was shortened. It's really a combination now of the M1 Grand and the M1 Carbine style of gas system. We have a piston up here striking the op rod back here. It's shorter, as you can see the barrel sticks out. We went from a 24 inch barrel on the Garand to a 22 on this. However, then we attached this long flash hider with bayonet lug. In the end, this is a longer gun than the Garand. The Garand is about 44 inches, this is, this is about 46. And even though we shaved up all the gas system and a good bit of the handguard in the front, and we're firing a smaller cartridge, once you put in the detachable mag, this is the same weight or even heavier than the Grand. Anyway, moving on, we went to a fiberglass upper handguard, wood stock. 
The metal butt plate was given a flip up shoulder rest for firing in full automatic. This was originally on the uh, M15 which was cancelled. They just carried it over to the M14. The rear sight is pretty well copied over from the Grand, although it is calibrated for meters as opposed to yards now. The trigger group is very similar but different for the new detachable mag and all of that. We have a steel 20 round mag. These are rock and lock. They, they're not straight in inserts. You have to kind of lock it in. We have a last round hold open but no release. So to drop the bolt we have to take the mag out. Let the bolt go forward. We do have a hold, a hold open device here. We can hold it open, but if we're open, we have no way to release using this device aside from pulling back the operatus midge. And again, rock and white mags. In the end, less than 25% of the parts from the Grand could be made to work in the M14. It really required its own tooling on production lines, so it ended up costing a lot more. It, it really the same as the FAO, with very few exceptions. It was adopted in 57. It did not go into full production until 1959, and it did not start to see combat until about 1961. And already by 1963, well, I'll, I'll rephrase that. In 1963, the last orders were placed by the government, with the last rifles delivered by TRW in 1965. So there you go. It was just getting in, and then it already started to go out. To be fair, in trials, it went up against the FAL, a very good rifle. It also went up against the AR-10, a very modern rifle, which turned into the AR-15, which, which eventually started to replace this in Vietnam in 1965 and in European theaters in 1969-1970. The M14 holds the distinction as the shortest service to life of any American rifle besides the Craig Jorgensen. So, yay. In the end, it replaced the Garand, and that was about it. It was not light enough and handy enough to really replace the carbine for many people. The select fire option was quickly deleted or, or put a, a block was put on it like on this one that's a fake selector but you get the idea because this gun was wholly uncontrollable and full auto by most everyone's account except for extremely high trained people so it never really replaced the 1918 BAR or the M3 it just it never lived up to what it was uh, supposed to do and I'm trying to be fair and unbiased here but it addressed a couple of the issues of the Grand, namely the magazine, but it never really addressed the op-rod issue. We still have a large exposed moving area here where dirt and debris can get in. I mean, wouldn't take much. We still have disassembly where you have to pull the trigger group out of the stock, which could lead to a swollen stock and all the issues that that would have. They tried to make it lighter than the Grand and shorter, but because of additions, it ended up being the same length and the same weight, if not even a little heavier. Plus now, instead of carrying around relatively light spring steel end block clips, we're carrying around multiple steel 20 round mags filled up. So on the way, this was a heavier loadout for a lot of soldiers. Now, let's compare that to this critter here. This is the Beretta BM-59, as I said. It's a pretty standard one. After World War II, Italy would adopt the M1 Grand. In 1949, it would purchase the rights to produce it and would be given the production line from Winchester by the U.S. government. 1953, it would start to make its own M1 Garands by Beretta and Brita. And then a short time later, after 7.62 NATO was starting to get widespread use throughout the Allies, 
Italy would turn and start to kind of look at look at the cartridge. Now it had just purchased the M1 Grand production line. It just got it up and running. But it thought, hey, we can rework the Grand to fire the 7.62 NATO cartridge. After all, it's the same as 30-06, just uh, shorter. So beginning in 1956, 1957, work began at Beretta to rework the Grand to fire it. And at the same time, they wanted to introduce select fire and detachable magazine. So the same general concept as the M14, the T44. There would be an advanced prototype called the BM-58, which would be tweaked a little bit and then adopted in 1959 as the BM-59. And these would go pretty much into immediate production because it really was a converted grand. While the M14 only used 25 or less parts, percent parts as the grand, the BM-59 Near, used nearly all the same parts as the Grand. Namely, it was built on the exact same receiver, used modified trigger groups, modified stocks, modified uprods, modified bolts. So while the parts are not directly interchangeable without modifications, they had all these Grands, Grand parts, and a Grand production line in Italy, and they were able to utilize that to make the BM-59. A few specific parts that came out for use on this gun, this folding light bipod, which not all the M59s had, but most in Italian service did. This is the earlier 5-inch tricompensator. It acts as a flash hider muzzle brake and mounts the bayonet. These early ones used a modified M1 Grand bayonet. Later ones would use a modified M1 Carbine or M16 bayonet. It doesn't have the grenade ring on this one. This rifle still has the grenade sights on the gas block. They would have several different barrel lengths, but most of these would be 19.4 inches plus this long hider. Now it's worth noting the barrel protrudes into the hider quite a ways. It goes to about right here. So that's just for stability. The barrel is based on the Garand, it's just shorter. Obviously the grenade stuff is unique to this gun. Handguard is Garand, it's just modified. The Operat, as I said, oops, let me get over here where I can get a good angle at her. There we go. We're magazine fed now. As with the M14, we can top it off with of stripper clips. Unlike the M14, though, we do have a bolt release right here. The magazines are similar in concept. They are also steel 20 rounds. They are heavier. Now, Italy would not issue that many mags with each gun, usually one to three, sometimes four or five, but usually not. Now, one thing, the way they did this mag well, it's pretty much a straight-in shot like a, um, you know, most M16 type rifles. You have to kind of wiggle it a little bit to lock it in. And when it comes out, it comes out at an angle. I guess it's very similar to say a HKG3. It um, has kind of a angle to it, but not like the, it's not really a rock and lock because the front tab is spring loaded. These are very well done mags. The M14 mags are good too, but the BM-59 mags are just so, so well done. Now this, since it is based on an M1 Grand receiver, is longer for 30-06, which can potentially have some problems. The BM-59, let me get that other mag out here. Come on. Comparing the two mag types here. Very similar. This one's a smidge heavier. These do have chrome or nickel followers. I think they're nickeled. Makes them quite smooth. So 
So in a lot of ways, the BM-59 is what the M14 promised to be. It is literally a shortened, lightened, modified Garand. And more importantly, it was cheap for Italy. It cost them far less time and money to make this thing. Now, because we did add on the bipod, the grenade, the tricomp, again, weight is about the same as a grand, maybe a smidge less. We are a little bit shorter. With this on here, we're at about 43 inches. So we're a couple inches shorter than the M14. We're an inch or inch or so shorter than the Garand. But like the M14, this was select fire. The difference is they did not often block these to semi only because this compensator was very effective in full auto. As effective as any light rifle in 308 can be, at least I should say. They were still meant to be fired, of course, in semi most all the time. A few of the unique features this gun has that the M14 does not. We have a winter trigger that folds down for use with gloves. Flip it over here. We have a rear sling swivel that rotates to the side for side use. It's worth noting this front swivel, while usually mounted on the side, can be mounted on the bottom. There's an equal point. You can unscrew the swivel and mount it below if you need to sling it from below. The standard BM-59 does not have a flip-up butt plate, but instead we have a rubber recoil pad, and in the center is a trap door for a uh, cleaning kit, very similar to just a standard Grand here. Two holes, so on and so forth. In fact, it's, it's nearly the same cleaning kit as issued with the Grand. So that's the BM-59. The M14 has a few advantages over it. Like I said, for one, the receiver was specifically built for 762 NATO, so it's a little bit shorter. The bolt has a roller in the rear for smoother functioning. It is a little smoother. It has an adjustable gas system for more widely ranging ammunition types to adjust gas flow, whereas the BM-59 uses the same type of plug as the M1 Garand. Now both would go to a straighter guide, excuse me, op rod compared to the Grand. If you notice, both the gas tubes are slung lower than on the Grand. That said, the BM is exposed here as the Grand would be. This is actually literally the gas piston here. Whereas on the M14, it's sealed up more. And the M14 is comes standard with a scope mount cut into the receiver. The BM-59 does not. There are ways to get scopes on the BM, but standard, it did not come with a scope mount. So I'm trying to be fair. The M14 did have a couple of advantages. To me, what really gives the nod to the BM, though, is the fact that they were able to do it cheaper and faster and still come up with a rifle comparable to the M14. They didn't waste near as much time and money. They were able to utilize a lot of their old grand parts, whereas the M14 required all new everything, pretty much. It's worth noting that while the M14 was out of service beginning in 65 and running through 70 as it was phased out, the BM-59 was standard issue in Italy until 1990 and was, um, you know, substitute second line standard up through the, the late 90s, even early 2000s. So it had a respectable service life. It's well liked for what it is. It's about as good as a 308 select fire rifle is going to probably get, especially one without a pistol grip. Now these are both the standard service versions, the most typical, but you both Springfield and Beretta would produce a few different variations of these, although adoption was pretty pretty minor, if anything. 
But these rifles are really worth comparing because the idea was exactly the same. In both instances, the country started with the Garand and wanted to make it into a select fire magazine fed 308 gun. But they went about it in very different ways. The U.S. went big with the big trials and big developments. Beretta and Italy went small, economical, and used what they had. And the fun thing is that they came up with just as good, if not even better gun, especially again, this, this tri-compensator. This is again, the five inch version. There's a longer seven inch version, which also acts as a grenade launcher, but the cuts on the end for compensation are the same on both. The M14 can launch rifle grenades too. It just requires another device to be attached to it. But yeah, thought we would compare the two. I do find it interesting today that um, M14 fans are also usually M16 fans, at least to some extent, American fans. And this uses a rock and lock mag, and you know, those same people, when it comes to 223 rifles, will espound the, the greatness of uh, both an external bolt release and a straight in mag, which the M14 had neither. But. The BM-59 had the external release, and it had a semi straight-in mag. Again, it's kind of like the HK-91. You had to kind of angle it a wee bit and wiggle it to snap in, but it's definitely a more direct shot than the M-14 because of the... They both have the same style of catch in the front of the magwell. The difference is the Berettas is spring-loaded, so as the mag comes up, it, it folds in and then pops back out to select the mag whereas on the M14 it's fixed so the mag has to select it basically. Mag catches are very similar. The M14 is a little wider, BM's a little longer. Durability, reliability wise, they're both quite good. They both have about the same pros and cons because they're using the same gas system. Again this has a 22 inch barrel, this has a 19.4. So a little bit longer barrel on the M14 but in practical terms, accuracy is the same. They both use exactly the same types of sights. And um, yeah, that's about all I can think to say on these critters. <laughs> but yeah, just thought we would compare two similar but different guns. If you have any questions or comments, please post them below. Really appreciate you tuning in. Love to hear your own thoughts on these two guns. So share them if you can. If you like the video, please click like. If you haven't already subscribed, we really appreciate it if you do so. As always, this is Misha, and we'll catch you next time.